Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for our live chat with Ed Brubaker and Marcos Martin. Uh, before we begin, I'm just going to start with uh, some interview questions, but please remember that this is an interactive chat, so we encourage you to ask as many questions as you would like through the Zoom chat feature. I'll be keeping an eye on the text chat and reading your questions throughout the session. And now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, first off, we have Ed Brubaker, who is one of the most acclaimed writers in comics, having won five Best Writer Eisner and Harvey Awards in the last 10 years. His best-selling work with Sean Phillips on Criminal, Fatal, The Fade Out, Bad Weekend, and Kill or Be Killed have been translated around the world to great acclaim, and Marvel's movies featuring his co-creation, The Winter Soldier, Bucky is everyone's favorite, have all been international blockbusters. <laughs> Ed lives in Los Angeles with his wife and their crazy dog, where he works in comics, film, and television, and his most recent work with Image Comics includes the Reckless series and Friday with our next speaker, Marcos Martin. Marcos is a Catalan comic book artist whose work at Marvel and DC includes such titles as Batgirl Year One, Amazing Spider-Man, and Daredevil. In 2013, Marcos founded the online platform Panel Syndicate together with writer Brian K. Vaughn and illustrator and colorist Munsa Vicente in order to distribute their creator-owned comic, Private Eye. The series went on to win an Eisner Award for Best Digital Web Comic and the Harvey Award for Best Online Comics Work. Panel Syndicate and The Private Eye have since received critical acclaim and media attention for their role as one of the first DRM-free pay-what-you-want comics, and they've continued to publish other critically acclaimed works, including Barrier, The Walking Dead, The Alien, and most recently, Friday. Uh, Ed and Marcos, thank you so much for being here with us today. I would love it if you would tell us a little bit about your most recent book. Ed? Oh, do you want to take it? <laughs> all right. Yeah, I'm going right. to let you uh, do all the promotional stuff. <laughs> and I'm going to be the slightly more depressive guy. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Every, every team needs one. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's uh, sad. I used to be that guy. Um, <laughs> uh, Friday is, is sort of our tribute to, at least for me, it's my tribute to all the young adult books that I sort of grew up loving in the in the 70s and that I sort of became re-obsessed with in my mid-20s. I had this brief phase before I became a professional comic writer where I really wanted to write young adult fiction like Judy Bloom or, or, or uh, Louise Fitzhugh or John Belair's. And, you know, I just I just had had uh, had a big fondness for that. I think it was like my my last clinging on to my youth was like, I lived next to a library and I would just go check out like the great brain books and stuff like that. And encyclopedia Brown. And so I just grew up really with those books and comics. And uh, one day I got this email from Marcos asking me if I wanted to write a comic for him. And suddenly like all of my old, like young adult, like uh, ideas just kind of came like rushing forward from the back of my mind, like, oh my God, Marcos could be perfect for a comic book version of some of this stuff. And I could do like, what happens when a young adult hero grows up? And, uh, you know, so I just kind of wrote him back in a rush with like probably way too many ideas and talked <laughs> about how he should start using cross hatching like Edward Gorey or something and, <laughs> and pitched him this weird sort of gothic uh young adult post young adult murder mystery uh set in like a sort of timeless 1970s era that we've timed it actually it's like the early 70s um and so it's it's kind of asking the question of you know what happens when the girl sidekick uh has to take over the case basically and what happens when she grows up and doesn't want to be seen in the shadow of you know the the hero boy character and uh it's really examining that that kind of coming of age story, but but from like that looking back at those times and sort of trying to add in, you know, some more of the the adult seriousness of like the early seventies as well. So in terms also of there are Lovecraftian monsters. <laughs> <laughs> 
forgot I that. I mean, part. it's set in the Northeast, and we all know that Lovecraft and monsters are just chock a block. It is, yeah. It. I mean, it's funny because uh, I have never lived in in New England, and the only friend that I have that I'm in close contact with is Joe Hill. So I asked him a bunch of what New England yeah. like small town life was like. And then I realized after we did the first chapter of Friday, the town that she lives in is called Kings Hill, which I didn't intentionally name after him and his father, but is suspicious. Come on. <laughs> it was really that I just looked at a bunch of New England places and that just seemed like the kind of name of a place that would exist there. <laughs> I'm, I don't believe a word of that. It's awesome. <laughs> the moment I got the script, I was like, well, he's obviously named the, the town after <laughs> Stephen King and Joe Hill. I mean, it seemed possible. No, it's okay would, to be a fan. That would be King Hill Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that was uh, going to be one of my first questions is the, that New England feel is so strong there. Um and so I didn't realize that you hadn't, weren't very familiar with it, Ed and, and Marcos. Have you spent much, if at any time there? I wanted, I actually wanted to, to we were looking at uh, some holidays uh, on, all on the East Coast uh, mm-hmm. just at that time so that I would, could, you know, be familiar with, with the area. But it, it didn't happen. Uh, so no, I've never been there. I, I've been to I've been to upstate New York. I've lived in upstate New York for uh, for a year, oh, wow. and but that's the closest I think I've been to to the East Coast. I mean to the Northern East Coast. Hmm. I've been to I've been I mean Buffalo, Rochester, all that area. I know that's uh, the closest I think that I've been. I think you can get a feel from it from there. I, I was really surprised at how strong that sense of place is in the story it's it's very visceral and very like relatable if you spent any time up there uh, it's, so i mean it's very it's very important to the story and so i did look at a lot of pictures yeah yeah uh in terms of marco's like, probably oh sorry no, no, go ahead. Oh, i was gonna say marco's probably spent like three or four months just sketching like what the town was gonna look like and and what the lighthouse would be and it was it was really fun to see um and then you know to see it all sort of come together i almost i almost hope that he has like a map of the actual town that he's made <laughs> i more i more or less know where the places are i have a <laughs> and i i really appreciate that ed is saying this with a smile on his face because you know three or four months of me you know <laughs> not doing anything with the script it's, uh, <laughs> i think it's daunting for any for any writer <laughs> I uh, know I'm I'm old now. I have no ambition. <laughs> <laughs> I just want it to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, no ambition, just perfection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that smile is also is also hiding the fact that there's a strong hint that you should make a map for the the <laughs> for the <laughs> special edition. Look. <laughs> But the inside you know, book cover needs to be. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think we might do that for the for the book. We should do that for the yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. Remember in the early days, we I was sending all those pictures of those old paperback map back covers for mysteries yeah. and stuff too, because I just love stuff like that. I like, like that. I love, yeah. Anytime I give Marcus a challenge in this thing, he just gets like both depressed, but then like excited. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a weird mixture. I mean, you don't want to be around me. It's kind of like <laughs> exciting depression, I guess. I this is the first time I think I've written sequences in a in a story where I have no idea how the artist is going to tackle it, like the storybook stuff. I just was like, oh, I want to have this part where suddenly we're looking at like a storybook of the legends of this town and this area, and I had no idea what he was going to do, and then it just blew me away. So I, I, I love. Was- you know, Every time I get one of those, I'm like, I'm really excited. And then it's five minutes later, I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> uh, Marcus, did you grow up with, uh, with detective fiction as well? Is there a strong tradition like there was in the States in the late 70s? Well, I guess late 60s through early 80s of that sort of kid detective teen gumshoe uh, uh, book. 
I mean, we had them when we had the, the translations over mm -hmm. here. Uh, so I know I know of them, but I wasn't I was not a big fan of. Uh, I mean, the big one here was uh, Enid Blyton, I guess. Um, and we had the Alfred Hitchcock series with the with the three detectives, I think. Oh yeah. Uh, but I, I I never read those. No, I've uh, um, the only young uh, adult literature that I remember reading was um, William, I guess. You know William, the character. It's uh, like from no. No, I don't know William. <laughs> it's big in Japan, I guess. Uh, <laughs> his his uh, I think he's from a uh, he's British actually, and he's kind of like a. a a boy living in uh, in the British uh, the British farm area of uh, of the nineteen thirties or twenties, I guess something like that, and that I loved. That that uh, and sometimes he had like mm, kind of mystery adventures, but not really. It was basically just him doing stuff. And uh, in the that, U.S., that's, that's the, the series, thing. the William series is known as Winnie the Pooh in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> But very funny, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> you should have read those. <laughs> Again, I'm so shocked because when you when you read through Friday, like everything just feels so like a real love letter to that genre. So I'm really surprised that I figured your answer was going to be I was steeped in it. Everything was Hardy Boys. I had a, a deer stalker hat when I was growing up and everything. <laughs> I'm just I'm just uh, good at pretending, I guess. <laughs> mm, very, very good. I'm, I'm a faker. <laughs> he knows the all... basics of the genre. Everybody kind of knows, right? Like, you know what Encyclopedia Brown is, even if you haven't read it. It's like, yeah, it's built in. Culture. Yeah, to yeah. the cult. Um, and a, a lot of your protagonists, uh, like you were mentioning, a lot of the protagonists that you're most well known for tend to be slightly older than Friday uh, and Lance are. Um, did you find that there was a big difference in terms of writing dialogue for a younger lead um, or was it, did you tackle it with ease? Um, I, I don't know, actually. I think I just, I, with every character that I write, I always just try to, especially main characters, like, you know, because you spend so much time in their head kind of or thinking about what they're thinking about. I think I just try to make sure everyone feels like a real person and and you know partly setting it back in the past I didn't have to worry about like modern slang or any kind of you know trying to make them feel like a like a 18 year old in today necessarily I, they felt like 18 year olds from when I was a kid when I would look up to like teenagers and I kind of remembered what like being in high school was like I have a really good memory so I kind of, you know, and it's sad when you think, because high school is usually everybody's worst time. At least, at least if you end up in comics, it's usually one of the worst times in your life. Okay. And so like, I, I having to like think back to high school memories is always a little bit torturous. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, uh, I kind of just wanted her to be like really smart and sort of a Harriet the Spy kind of a character, but but with that sort of supernatural edge too. And um, and I wanted it to be like, like she was kind of the badass of the of the duo more. And so I just kind of wrote it as it came and, and really just kind of tried to make their lives feel real to me. Like these, these, you know, kids who met when they were really young, who sort of became detectives together um, and, you know, and throw in the occasional like, you know, uh, teenage outburst. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that in a lot of your work, there isn't a huge amount of slang, despite the fact that you, your protagonists will exist in these worlds that are, you know, it's the eighties, but nobody says radical. And, you know, it's, we're, <laughs> we're in the fade out, but you don't, you you might hear gams once or twice, but you know. Yeah. Um, I think that makes it easier for modern readers to see themselves in the character without being bogged down by, by yeah, unfamiliar get, language. It can get distracting, mm. you know. Like no one wants to hear Friday say boss. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I do now. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I also like the fact that that when Friday is coming home, 
she's sort of dealing with something that is specific to, I think, her circumstances. Um, you know, this unique mystery solving detective duo. How do you recapture that as a burgeoning adult? But it's also something that everyone can relate to because there's that feeling after you go to college of like, you can never go home again. Um, is that something that, that the both of you sort of identified with, or did you feel a disconnect when you left home for the first time and, and came back? I definitely, that was one of the, the main things for the story for me was I just thought, what's that, you know, you're that youth detective, you've gone off to college, your partner has stayed back in the small town where you, where you grew up solving mysteries together and, you know, maybe stopping like, you know, supernatural threats and you come back and it's like, it's always, what do you come back for? It's like, you come back for Christmas the first year, like probably you don't come back for Thanksgiving on your first year at college, like unless you live like half an hour away and your mom makes you, <laughs> um, <laughs> but like you have to go back for that first Christmas. And I remember like all those early Christmases, uh, like in my teens and twenties when I moved away from home and, and went home for Christmas and going out with all your friends from high school and how everything just felt like, sort of normal but sort of wrong and sort of you know like like those are the people who weren't going to let you grow kind of but they also were the people that you felt the most comfortable around mm -hmm. um and I really I really wanted to mine that like I thought that would be a good um structure to tell the story around too is like oh it's Christmas vacation and you know this horrible mystery is happening all of a sudden I think I think it's a it's a very relatable experience that almost anyone has had at some point. In my case, for example, it was it was the same thing, but actually the opposite because uh, I spent a year in the in the U.S., but it was my like my high school year. So uh, when I went back to to Barcelona, um, you have that kind of feeling of well, you know, I mean, you're back with your friends and your family and everything. But there's I spent almost uh, the uh, a big chunk of of the next year thinking about you know, this how wonderful it would be to go back to high school, actually the, so the opposite of, uh, of what Friday is, is going through. But it's, but it's the same, it is it's the same experience actually. It's the same feeling of being kind of uh, displaced in a way, you know, everything's kind of similar, but you're no longer the same person. Mm -hmm. And you kind of long for something that's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting because it informs the story uh, with this, or it, it places in the back of the story, this undercurrent of sort of, uh, like you said, uh, feeling sort of disconnected or a sense of existential just wrongness. Uh, and since you're telling a story with mysteries and, and Lovecraftian horrors and things in the woods, that feeling of, of unease uh, gets played out both in the real and the unreal. So I think that's very... I think actually, in the, if uh, you look at the second issue, mm. the the most horrifying part of, of, of the story, I think so far, is not actually the monster in the woods, but the scene <laughs> before that, <laughs> the, the love scene between between Friday and and Lance. Sorry, spoiler alert. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but that that was horrifying. That's yeah. like, that, that's I... terror. The that awkward makeout session. Two <laughs> hashtag relatable for me. Thank you. No, no thank you. <laughs> I closed that issue and called my therapist. I was like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but both Friday and Lance. Actually, uh, speaking of that, that's spoiler. Um, you know, they are they are dealing with or not dealing with a trauma. Um, and that's like a huge element of interest with these archetypal young detectives. Um, why did you choose to tackle that sort of thing specifically or, or add that into the story? Um, well, I think like for me growing up, a lot of my, a lot of my closest friends were girls. Mm -hmm. And as you, it's like fine when you're a little kid, but as you get into your teenage years, it can sometimes get complicated and you can be best friends with somebody, but you can have jealousies about each other or you hate their boyfriend, you know, but you're not totally sure why. And I kind of wanted to tackle that because it's like, that's the, you know, the young adult growing up part is like, does Encyclopedia Brown want to make out with Sally? 
She just said goodbye <laughs> and hugged me. <laughs> you know, like, like um, and I just felt like that would, that would be a really complicated thing. It's like you, you, you define yourself, especially if you're such close friends, you can define yourself by your friendships, uh, like as you're growing up and going through puberty and stuff. Um, and I felt like, she in the book is, you know, she's like the sidekick slash bodyguard character, whereas he's like the the weird aloof kid who's three years younger than everybody else and always smarter than everyone in the room. And and I felt like part of the story is she wants to get out from that shadow. And yet at the same time, she's defined herself so much by that. And she wonders, like, am I destined to be with him? Like, oh, he's the only person who really understands me. So I just liked that complexity of it. And, and I also wanted to get into that thing of when you decide to cross that line and you like make out with your best friend and suddenly it feels like kissing your sister or something, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> thank you. Thank you Ed, for making me draw that. <laughs> <laughs> I told in the script it even says like we're seeing it we're just seeing like the weird things around the room she's looking at instead of him <laughs> so it's like even more awkward yeah <laughs> we have a question coming in from Brandon uh Brandon says my sense of Friday is that it isn't necessarily a deconstruction of old YA ooh, Freudian slip misery books mystery books <laughs> but almost like a nostalgic reflection on what it would be like to grow up in one of those books. Is that what Friday and Lance are experiencing, having to really look back on what a crazy life it would have been to live in a book like The Hardy Boys or The Great Brain? Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe to some degree. I think, I think that's true. It's definitely... That's another part of the the theme of the of the series. One of the themes is that nostalgia, because you have that nostalgia for your youth. It's strange how quickly you get nostalgia for your own youth. Um, you know, I remember uh, when I was in my like mid twenties, talking to someone who had just moved to town. And all they did was sort of reminisce about high school. And I just thought, oh, wow, like we developed nostalgia for our lives really early. Um, but yeah, I definitely wanted them to feel like characters from those books, like that kind of world um, of, of that sort of weird, our world, but not really reality, um, so that we would all sort of project ourselves onto them. It's like, we know what it's like to be a character in a young adult series. Like we all have read different ones at some point in our lives. And so I wanted them to sort of be iconic versions of that uh, as well as you know and then just take it seriously you know it's like if you do a story about a superhero and it's like I wouldn't want to do the one about what they do during their day job I would be like oh how do you get your costume fixed or you know, <laughs> like, like all the behind the scenes stuff that normal people have to deal with stuff but but uh, so I really wanted to just sort of be like yeah what is that what would it really be like to be one of those characters and grow up yeah. You know, and, and how do you like what happens to, you know, that character when they become like 45 years old? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great question of, of, you know, does the Joker make his own suits? Does he yeah. have a sewing machine? What? <laughs> I think it's a stain on his lapel. Where does that gas come from? Is he a exactly. chemist? <laughs> <laughs> when you fall into a vat of chemicals, you actually do become a chemist. That's yeah. That's <laughs> Double secret origin. He was a comedian and now he's a an amazing inventor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's Elon Musk. Oh, God. Um, so Friday was initially published online with Panel Syndicate. And I'm wondering what the process is like creating a work for digital media uh, that is then going to be transferred to a physical medium, to a published as a, as a physical book. Are there any specific um, elements to the process that change when you have to keep that in mind? Well, uh, we discussed uh, earlier on uh, a lot about the, the format because I insisted it on being a landscape format because that's <laughs> the best format for, uh, for digital because it's, uh, it's like universal. You can, you can uh, read it on a widescreen uh, uh, laptop computer or you can read it on, a, on an iPad or a tablet or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but Ed, Ed insisted that it, it, uh, he couldn't deal with that. He could, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was, I'm, 
I'm such a print person. I, I just ultimately was like, do it however you want digitally. But when the books come out, it should just look like a regular book. <laughs> uh, yeah. Basically. So, then, so yeah, we, we decided to, to just go for a, for a double uh, format uh, where it's actually, it's just, it's just the regular comic book format the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, you can. Uh, we have a, a special uh, PDF where you can uh, display them in a in a widescreen. So we put two of them together. So yeah. that way you you can uh, you don't have to scroll down if you're watching it on a on a on a laptop device or you know. Yeah, and that way uh, also if you're reading the digital version, the double page spreads will not have anything getting lost in the in the spine. Exactly. Which that's and, you know, it also, also important detail right in the very middle of the <laughs> <laughs> this is revenge. <laughs> I'm putting all the lettering in the middle. So <laughs> God, I would kill you. <laughs> no, it's actually it's been it's been very interesting for me because for the first time ever I've been able to work knowing exactly which page is gonna be, you know, the left page and the right page. So I know exactly that like with the private eye or barrier, I know which was the, the, the page turn because all of them were page turns. Yeah. But in this case, uh, it's the first time ever that I've worked with a, with a comic book format, knowing exactly which page is going to be the turn page and, and which, page, which page is going to be on the, to the left and to the right. So oh, that's, wow. that's interesting. I forgot about that because working at Marvel and, and DC, you're never 100% sure after page yeah. one. Maybe you never know. Pages, you're like, okay, they're not going to put an ad between the first three pages, but then they do. <laughs> I've had that yeah, happen. <laughs> you actually never know. Yeah, that's funny because uh, I think about that all the time when I write. I'm always like, this is a page turn. This is a page like. So I try to hit those rhythms and make sure I'm not revealing anything really important on the very last, like before the page turn. It's like save it a panel. <laughs> and actually, and now. Uh... Because we we do change sometimes where I, I add a page or, or we take a page out or whatever. Yeah. But we always make sure that the page turn is, yeah. uh, stays the same. So yeah. that the, yeah. we end it in the with the bit that we want to end the page. Yeah, this is the other thing about Marcos that that people should know is like you send him a script and then he goes through it and he actually will add pages to your scenes. He'll be like, this should be four pages instead of two. And, <laughs> and then uh, during the during the third chapter, he sent this sequence over, and it was so good that I asked him to expand it by two pages so it could, so he could take more time with it. <laughs> it was like the scene where she's sledding down the hill towards the forest, and I was just like, "Oh, we don't have enough. We need more room for this." And then it became like a double page spread, and it was just you know. But again, again, thank you. <laughs> but that's the great thing about the panel syndicate part of it too is like we're just creating it and putting it out a chapter by chapter on panel syndicate as as it is completed so we're not you know driven by anything other than you know marcus's perfection or lack of or lack of well, that's, obsession. Yeah. <laughs> his obsession with being perfect <laughs> Let's let's leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I got completely lucky. It is the I think, you know, I've been a fan of Marcus's for God, I feel like 20 years now or more since we like I don't even remember when we met. It was so long ago. But um, but I think this is the best and and most different art that he's ever done in his whole career, too. Like I don't think anyone expected a young adult horror mystery thing from the two of us. <laughs> It was a actually it, it was it was uh, it was amazing. It was a little bit of serendipity, I think, because uh, as Ed was saying before, when I when I wrote him that email, I had been thinking for a long time of doing something uh, a little bit different with my art style, trying you know cross hatching, which I've always kind of uh, steered away from. And uh, I was thinking it would be cool to do a project like that, but I had no idea. I mean, I. When I contacted Ed, I was I didn't know what he was gonna pitch. And suddenly he came back with this idea for something like very Edward Gray thing. And I was like, this is exactly what I had in mind. Like, <laughs> how how is this possible? So now I'm thinking that he probably has some kind of cameras in my, yeah. in my <laughs> home or something. 
So I have, I have hacked your email. Yeah. <laughs> There's something fishy there. I just yeah. don't know. A, a um, lot of people think that it's Jeff Bezos listening to you on Alexa, but it's actually Edward Baker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, well, it's funny because like when we, whenever we talk about the craft stuff, like Marcos and I, I think both somehow him in Spain and me over here looked at a lot of the same kind of stuff growing up. So like sometimes he'll send me like a, a breakdown or something. And I'll be like, oh, that reminds me of Little Orphan Annie or something or the way you're doing, he, he does the lettering in this really, like no one letters like Marcos does. And it reminds me of like a newspaper strip from the thirties or something. It's like, it's all these different sort of uh, formal things that, that he and I are both really into, I think really meshes well together. Cause the only time we ever worked together before, I think was just on that Captain America annual where it was like, yeah. we are like trying to uh, hit a two week yeah. deadline or something because someone bailed. <laughs> and yeah. That was crazy. That, that was, yeah. that was me doing like, 15 pages in in a month which you know yeah. it's not yeah. bad. Good. <laughs> and then hopefully laying down for a year good yeah. lord <laughs> <laughs> well um sadly we're out of time but uh david had a comment i wanted to make sure to get to you it says not a question just wanted to say i am a big fan of mr brubaker thank you oh well, thank you thank you <laughs> what, what about me i was like <laughs> Not a big fan. We're both we're both chopping. Apparently <laughs> not. Sorry. Minor, minor fan. <laughs> Just a little fan. <laughs> he says, uh, Brandon says, thank you, Ed and Marcos. This has been a pleasure. And I also wanted to thank you both and uh, ask where our audience members can follow you outside of the conference. Online, not in person. Don't give out your address. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Marcos has the Panel Syndicate uh, Twitter account, and uh, you can go look at panelsyndicate.com and find lots of different great digital comics, including Friday. Um, I have a newsletter that I have no idea how to tell people how to subscribe for, but I have like 8,000 subscribers on it, so someone must know how. If you type Ed Brubaker newsletter into Google, it probably comes up. I, I was able if, if I was able to do it, anyone can do it. I was yeah. able to just mark us figure it out. So so Google it or you guys can also email us at info at imagecomics.com. Oh, yeah. We'll 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 link you. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> We're here to help. <laughs> and I show lots of like previews for stuff in the newsletter and you know art process and, and behind the scenes stuff all the time. So it's a oh. it's a cool thing. Brandon is on it. Thank you, Brandon. He's uh, he's gone ahead and put a link in the chat. You wow. guys, librarians sure. are the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm well, a big fan though, Marcos. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Ed, uh, thank you. I mean, <laughs> how's the next chapter coming? <laughs> oh, I just just kill me already. Just why don't you? Well, thank you both so much. And thanks to our audience. Uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful day. And don't forget to check out Friday coming soon to a library near you. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thanks.